Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Let's go ahead and let's stand together. And before we pray, before we get into the song, I'd like to do something that we usually don't do, which is to talk about the song that we're about to do. We usually just play it. But this is a new song that we're introducing today. It's called Honey in the Rock, which is kind of an interesting title. And, you know, it might, like Honey in the Rock. I mean, I've heard of Honey in the Lion with Samson and Judges, but Honey in the Rock, well, actually it comes from Psalm 81. And it's a psalm. God is pleading to his people to follow him and not to follow after other gods, other false gods that cannot satisfy, cannot fulfill, cannot deliver, but only he can do that. And it says there towards the end, oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him. They would be doomed forever forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. And the song, if it's from that, about how the Lord satisfies completely. We have everything we need in him. He is enough. Amen? It's, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, our Lord, our King. We are complete in him. And so let's worship him together this morning. Amen? There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsting for the living world.
trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus.
thousand generations Falling down in worship To sing the song of ages to the Lamb And all who've gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all.
thank you, Lord, for our time of worship, Lord. Truly, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord. We thank you for how you provide, how you guide us by your spirit, Lord. And we thank you for how you're going to speak to us, Lord. As we open up your word this morning, Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts and our ears will be attentive to you, how you speak to us, Lord, by your word. And we pray that you would help us to apply what you teach us this morning, Lord. I pray that it will be a comfort, Lord, to each one of us this morning, Lord, and that we would be looking for your soon return, Lord, at any moment, Lord, as we saying might be today, Lord. We just pray that we be those that are looking for your turn ready, Lord, about your business, abiding in you, Jesus, bearing fruit for your glory as we wait upon you, Lord. So, Lord, this morning, I just pray that you remind us of that. Help us have an eternal perspective and that you do a fresh work by your spirit as only you can do amongst us, Lord. May you be glorified. May you increase, Lord. May we decrease in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's take a quick moment and just say hello to your neighbor there. All right, good morning. Welcome this morning. Happy Mother's Day. All you moms, so grateful for the moms, aren't we, here today? There is a uh, photo backdrop so we can take pictures with our moms over in the warehouse. And so if you get a chance to drop by there, since the rain finally stopped, didn't it? Did it finally stop? No? Sort of? I don't know. Maso Menos? Is that you say? A little more or less. Uh, so no evening services tonight. We'll resume 4 o'clock service next week. No evening services tonight. Spend some time with your moms. And then uh, don't forget, this coming Saturday, we have the men's conference down at Calvary Chapel in Houston. You can get signed up. Also, we have a van that will be driving from here down to uh, Friendswood for that conference you can sign up at the uh, Connection Center if you want to uh, save gas, jump in the van, and head down with the rest of the guys. And then uh, last is we have next week, Sunday, um, New Believers class. So I know that started last month, and so we will resume next Sunday at uh, 12.30, 12.45 here in the sanctuary. So with that, we have a Bible study this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we left off. If you would, open your Bibles with me. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. 1 Thessalonians 4, where we're at. First Thessalonians 4, it's so nice to finally arrive at this portion of chapter 4. You guys are familiar with this, aren't you? This passage? Yeah? God said to Jeremiah, my word is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Isn't that what it felt like the last couple Sundays where, we, where we've been? Just, just doing some demo on the hard parts of our hearts. And then God also said to Jeremiah, my word is like a fire also. And it certainly burns away the chaff, but it also, it also sets our hearts ablaze with love for our Savior, for Jesus Remember the guys on the road to Emmaus? They got a good case of heartburn when they were talking to Jesus. That's what we need this morning. And so let's pray and ask the Lord to just uh, light the fire in our hearts. Lord, we just thank you this morning. Um, as we sang, as, as Michael shared, there is nothing better than you. There is nothing, no one greater, no one better. 
You're the best, Lord Jesus. And we trust that the songs have blessed your heart, that we are able to please you and honor you this morning. It's you who we've come to celebrate. And so, Lord, thank you as we continue to worship you for your word. And yes, it is truly like a hammer and truly like fire. And we recognize we need every bit of it. And so thank you, even for the tough portions, Lord, for those that aren't so tough, for how you serve us, Lord, this beautiful buffet of everything we need in your timing. And so we open our hearts now. We desire for you to meet with us in a special way. We need a fresh work of your spirit here. And so have your way in this place in our lives and in your church. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Just by way of reminder, um, just to set the context, remember the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that he had planted uh, in northern Greece along the eastern shore, um, a city called Thessalonica, during his first, not his first, his second missionary journey. And this amazing church Um, grew out of a very difficult situation. Um, There was persecution. It was a gnarly stuff happening in in Thessalonica. In fact, the Apostle Paul got run out of town with his team about approximately about a month or less. And so he had left there, had departed, but he was concerned for these new believers, how they were doing in their walk with Jesus. And then ultimately, you remember the Apostle Paul sent Timothy back and Timothy went there to strengthen the the believers and to comfort them, and and then Timothy came and told Paul, and Paul was super stoked to get the good news, that they were continuing to press on, to trust Jesus, to trust his word, that their love was abounding and growing, and amazing things were happening by the Spirit of God in this church, and Paul now, as we've come into chapter 4, he's been talking about perhaps questions that the church may have had. Um, he, had, he had been there, again, for a short period of time. He had taught these new believers about eschatology, about end times events. And, and don't let anyone ever tell you it's, it's uh, a new believer can't be taught eschatology or things about the rapture and the second coming and, and the tribulation. If Paul saw it fit to teach them, it's fit for us as well to understand how things are going to roll out. God wants us to understand. And so... The Apostle Paul, no doubt, is answering some questions and certainly concerning eschatology as we get into this next portion of Scripture. So let's read, and we'll break it down together and then uh, put some application on this. Chapter 4, verse 13, here's what God's Word says. The Apostle Paul writes, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Isn't that beautiful? Man, that's amazing. Hallelujah. So good. And so the Apostle Paul says, number one, I do not want you, brethren, to be ignorant. And that's not the first time Paul has addressed the church and the church's ignorance concerning certain issues. In fact, when Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, he's saying, I don't want you to be out to lunch. I don't want you to be clueless. 
I don't want you to lack understanding concerning this. And if you are taking notes, you can check it out later. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Romans in chapter 11 of the book of Romans, Paul said he didn't want the church to be ignorant concerning God's plan for Israel. God is not through with the Jew. And I think the church is so ignorant of that, even the evangelical church, that, uh, that we should not be ignorant of that. God has purposes and plans attached to Israel. Not only that, if you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 11, or chapter 12, rather, the Apostle Paul said that he, he was concerned that we would not be ignorant concern, concerning spiritual gifts. And there's a lot of ignorance concerning spiritual gifts as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul spoke to the church and said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning trials and difficulties that happen when you are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And we certainly can be ignorant of that too. Why am I going through this? What's going on in my life? The Lord has purposes and plans attached to your life and my life as well. And not only that, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, that we would not be ignorant concerning Satan's devices, his schemes, his plans, his strategies, specifically unforgiveness. Specifically unforgiveness. And you know what? The church is so ignorant concerning that. We are to forgive one another, aren't we? No, we to forgive one another. We are to forgive one another even as God in Christ has forgiven us. He's forgiven our sins and chosen to remember them no more. And now Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning your brothers and sisters that have died and gone home to be with the Lord and the rapture of the church. And there is certainly a lot of ignorance concerning this issue. And I'm so glad that Paul clears this up for us this morning. In fact, listen, we should be comforted, shouldn't we, by hearing these words? And we are not just to be comforted, we are to comfort one another with these words. If you are reading, listen, if you are reading these words this morning, or if you are studying these words this morning, and you're not comforted, you're reading it the wrong way. You're not reading it right. Or if you're reading this, and it, and it gets you to get into a fight with another believer, guess what? You're reading it, you're studying it wrong. You're, this is meant to be a comfort for all of us this morning, and we are to comfort one another. It's mutual, it's reciprocal, what we're learning this morning. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning, what does he say? Those who have fallen asleep. Is that talking about people that are taking naps in church right now? Wake up if you are. No. Is that, talking, is that what we're talking about? Taking a nap, falling asleep? What's it speaking of? Death of a believer. Always in the New Testament, Falling asleep is concerning a believer that has gone home to be with the Lord. If you're taking notes, I'm going to read it real quick. John chapter 11. John chapter, remember when Lazarus died? This is so good. Listen to this. Jesus said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. He'll sleep it off. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> That's clarity, right? <laughs> and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. If you're taking notes, Acts chapter 7, right at the end of the chapter, remember Stephen gave this amazing um, sermon, um, amazing speech, if you will, in front of the Sanhedrin, all these religious leaders, and remember what happened to him. They stoned Stephen. They were tweaked. They didn't like what he was saying, and they stoned Stephen, this is verse 59, Acts 7, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. I wonder where he learned that from. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so we see this is a metaphor or a euphemism 
for the death of a believer. So Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those brothers or sisters that have died and gone home to be with the Lord. And so this is like super crucial this morning to understand that, and we're going to talk about it in just a moment, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our last breath here as believers will be our first breath in the Lord's presence. There's no soul sleep. That's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about that at all. And so he says there in the end of the verse, he says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So Paul's concern for them was that they wouldn't sorrow as the unbeliever sorrows. Listen, when we've lost a loved one, some of you guys know this personally, it hurts. It's devastating. It's painful. There is sorrow. The depths of sorrow and grief we experience just like an unbeliever. However, the difference is, as believers, we have hope, whereas an unbeliever has no hope. Are you with me this morning? What is our hope? Well, Peter told us, if you're taking notes, 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So did you hear what Peter's saying? He says, you as believers, you and I, because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we have a living hope. Our hope as believers is different than the hope of unbelievers or the wor- or worldly hope. Worldly hope is what? I hope this happens. I hope I hit it rich. I hope I strike it rich. I hope I get a job. I hope I, whatever, I get an A in my algebra class or whatever. It may or may not happen, man. But for us, our hope is the absolute expectation of good. Why? Because our hope is based upon the promises of God in his word. So crucial to understand that this morning. You and I have hope, and we are not to sorrow as those who don't have hope. And listen, it is important to grieve. It is important to go through the grieving process, but always to remember and to be reminded, listen, this is not the end of the road for us. Listen, death is not permanent. Separation is not the end of the story. Paul's reminding the church, you will be reunited with your brothers and sisters that have died in the Lord. Because no doubt they had a question. They're waiting for the return of Jesus. They're looking for the rapture, his imminent return. And guess what's happening? People are dying. Brothers and sisters are dying and going home to be with the Lord. And they're wondering, what's going on? Where do they go? What's happening? The rapture hasn't happened yet. And so Paul wants to bring some clarity to this. So there's no ignorance concerning this issue. Well, look what he says. Let's keep rolling. What's it say? What does he say? For, that's a reason word, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe that this morning? That's how, that's how you become a Christian. <laughs> Real simple. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus died and rose again, and he said to his disciples, he said, because I live, so you too shall live. And Paul's saying, hey, since we believe that, if we believe that, even so, look what it, look what it says to me, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when the Lord returns to this earth to get us for the rapture, to take us to the Father's house, he's going to be bringing who with him? Our brothers and sisters that went ahead of us and died and went home to be with Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Is that exciting? We're going to be reunited. That separation is not permanent. It's temporary. In fact, It says in, if you're taking notes, I'm going to flip over there, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, so 
So Paul reminds them, reminds the church of Thessalonica, your brothers and sisters that have died, they're with the Lord. How do we know that? Where else does it say that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, listen to what it says with me. Chapter 1, or chapter, chapter, let's start at chapter 1, we'll go through 2 Corinthians. You guys don't have to be out of here for a couple hours. Before we, no, it's Mother's Day. Make it quick, Pastor. <laughs> for we know, we should know this, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. Why? That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. This is so awesome. So what's he saying there? He's saying, listen, as he's writing this, he's saying, listen, we are in tents. Our, that's what he likens our bodies to, as tents. Are tents permanent? No. Do they collapse? Do they fall apart? In the Old Testament, our bodies are called carcasses. That's a little more fitting, isn't it? I got my carcass out of bed today, and I dressed my carcass. Some of us get nips and tucks on our carcasses, try to keep them, keep those carcasses young. Listen, there's a new body waiting for us. That the, the old bod is from the sod, the new bod is from God. That's how we can remember it. New body. And he says, in this we groan, and we do groan, don't we? For, some of the kids are saying, no, this is already the glorified body right here. Check out the six-pack and just wait. Just wait. One word, gravity, right? But it's like, these are tents, and God has something way better for us, bodies fitted for eternity that are similar but not the same. If it was the same, it would be reincarnation, and that's no good. They're similar, but not the same. And we'll talk about this more in just a little while. So Paul reminds the church that when, when that tent is wiped out, man, there's a new body awaiting for you. It is my personal belief, I believe, that when we take our last breath here, we take our first breath in the Lord's presence, and we get our new bodies then. That's my opinion, by the way. Some people disagree. They say we get a, a temporary body, a loner, until the rapture when the dead in Christ rise first and get their new bodies at the last trumpet. Um, but my opinion on this is that, man, once, once we go home to be with the Lord, we are outside of the time-space continuum. We are in the eternal now. And how, how do you believe that? Why do you believe that, Pastor? Ephesians 2.6 says, God already sees us seated in the heavenlies. So it's not a disembodied spirit. We're going to have a body. <laughs> And so the, the point that Paul's making, though, is that when, when a loved one dies in the Lord, they go immediately to the presence of God. In fact, Paul goes on to say, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. That's such an important verse. We live, man, you don't want to live by that which is visible, it's emptiness, you want to live by faith, trusting the Lord, trusting his promises, see, enduring as seeing him who is invisible, looking at the things which are not seen. We are confident, listen, we are, com are you confident this morning? Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Did you catch that? Paul's like, man, what's well pleasing? is to be absent from the body and to be present with Jesus. In fact, he says something similar. If you're taking notes, I'm going to flip over there. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, 
I know this is a little technical, but we need this this morning to be reminded. Philippians 1, Paul, Paul says, listen, for to me, I don't know about you, but for to me to live is Christ and to die is, to die is gain. And he says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I love this passage. Paul's like, I don't know, you know what, I'm hard-pressed. I want to go home to depart and be home with Jesus, but for me, what's better right now, that would be way better, but what's better right now is for me to be with you, to keep ministering to you. But the point that's made is, if I depart, I'm home with Jesus. Does everybody see that with me? We good? Everybody good on that? Okay. Back to 1 Thessalonians. So the Lord's going to bring with him those who sleep in Jesus that's, that's amazing. Great comfort, great reminder about our loved ones, correct? We know where they are, Jesus is coming, and we will all be together. Correct? Separated temporarily, briefly, in light of eternity. So Paul's comforting them. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. I need to stop just there for a second. So Paul says, this is something that Jesus said. This is not something made up. This is not something that Paul concocted or the early church concocted or later church members concocted. He's saying this is straight from Jesus. Did Jesus ever talk about his return? Did he ever talk about the rapture? He sure did. His coming for his bride In fact, he said some of the most comforting words in Scripture, in my opinion. Remember what he said in John 14? Let not your heart be troubled. Why why did he have to say that? Where were their hearts? Troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Where's the Father's house? In heaven. Many rooms, many... Listen, the greatest carpenter that ever lived is making a place for you and me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Who's the you? Us. He's preparing a place for you and I. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again. That's his return and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's like one of the clearest, for me, one of the clearest passages concerning Jesus' return for us, the church, the bride of Christ, for us to be taken together. We're going to read in a minute. Pulled out of here to go to the Father's house together. Mass evacuation. Anybody ready for that? Jesus, Jesus, the last three things he said in the Bible, last three times we read, red, when you read the red letters, who's speaking? Jesus. He said, behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Literally means suddenly. His return is imminent, and it's going to happen with no warning whatsoever. He compared it to a, as a thief, in the, a thief in the night. Does a thief give you a heads up? Like a little text message, I'll be there at 302 sharp. Does he send you, right? He or she, I don't know. Some hood, hoodies or girls. No warning. Out of nowhere. I don't mean to make light of that. I've had everything stolen before. It is not fun. Some of us have gone through loss in that way. But Jesus, Jesus says, when I'm coming, it's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to be unexpected. And in light of that, he says, we are to be ready and about our Father's business. In fact, John would write later, after hearing Jesus say this, John would write later, this should have a purifying effect on our lives. If we have this hope of the Lord coming for us, 
to return for us, the bride. We have that hope. Anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. When we're looking for the Lord's imminent return at any moment, it should have a purifying effect on our hearts and on our lives. And not only that, Paul says that there's a crown promise to anyone that's looking for his appearing, loving his appearing, his return. Special crown. That sounds pretty cool to me. So Jesus spoke about his return. And then he said, look at verse 15 with me. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And so I just want to point out the Apostle Paul is using a personal pronoun, we. Correct? You guys see that? That means that Paul was living his life in anticipation of the Lord's return at any moment. Do you, does everybody see that with me? Yeah, you guys still with me this morning? He was, li- man, because you hear that sometimes. Jesus said that 2,000 years ago, man. You believe that? In fact, Peter said that people would mock his return, saying the very same thing. I believe, this is my own opinion again, is that I believe that God wanted every generation looking for his immediate return, living in expectation, having a light touch on the things of this world, not living for the things of this world to make a name in this world for ourselves, but to live full on for Jesus because that trumpet's going to sound at any moment. And the Apostle Paul lived in expectation even up to the end of his life when he was beheaded, looking for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he says, listen, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We're not going to go before those who have already died and gone before to be with the Lord. For, reason word, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first or will rise prior or ahead. So the Lord himself, Jesus is coming. Where's he going to come from? Where's he descending from? From heaven, from the Father's house. He's, he's coming down, right? You guys see the picture here? He's coming down, the Lord himself, and what does it say? From heaven with a shout. And that word shout in the Greek, it, it's used for commanding soldiers, commanding their army. It also speaks of um, the captain of a ship. You know those guys that row oars? Was that Ben-Hur? They were rowing the oars. I'm dating myself, aren't I? <laughs> you could Google it. They're, 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 Guys on a ship, you got in a galley, and there's a guy calling out the orders. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Okay, just you guys stroke, right? To get the boat turns, that what happens? Uh, I have no clue. Yeah, you Navy guys. Are... <laughs> a paddle with one arm, you're gonna go one one direction. So yeah. Anyways, so that's the picture. Is is orders going out? And not just that, with the voice of an archangel. And some people believe that it's Michael the archangel that is there with Jesus. There is only one archangel mentioned in Scripture. I, this is my personal belief. I think it's the, the beauty and majesty of his voice. And then the trumpet of God. Do, do, do. And you guys remember what trumpets are used for in the Scriptures? They're used to muster everybody, to gather, the, gather everybody together, not only for battle, but also for worship, right? A trumpet would be blown and everybody would know, it's time to get together to worship, to seek the Lord together. That's the picture here that's happening. And I think, again, my own opinion, I think it's only believers that can hear what is being, what is being communicated. Why do I believe that? Um, If you're taking notes, I'm going to flip over there. Gospel of John. I forgot the chapter. Chapter 12. John 12. Because you think about the, about the, the voice of the Lord... 
He said, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. And so here, listen to what it says in John 12. Jesus says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I, for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. I think when the rapture happens in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we get pulled out of here. We, but we hear his voice first. We hear the trumpet. We hear the sound. And we're gone. And people are scratching their heads. Was that thunder? But it's going to be weird, man. And if you're still here, oh, if you're still here, look out. If you're still here, look out, man. It's going to be heavy how things are going to unfold. It's not an accident that the Lord brought you here today. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to be on board with us. He wants his house filled in heaven, that we would be with him forever. And so, in uh, remember in Acts chapter 9 also, Acts chapter 9, remember when uh, the Apostle Paul, when Jesus showed up? Remember when Jesus showed up with the Apostle Paul? Should we go through Acts chapter 9 next? Acts chapter 9, Jesus apprehended Paul, right, on the road to Damascus, heading northbound out of Israel, right, on the warpath, wanting to kill Christians, and all of a sudden, boom, light shines all around Paul, knocks him off his high horse of pride, which is what needs to happen to every one of us. Correct? And Jesus speaks, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You guys remember this? The guys that were with him, they heard a sound but didn't know what was communicated. I think personally, I think that's what's going to happen at the rapture. People around us that don't know the Lord, what was that? Thunder? Is that an angel speaking? What's going on? But for us, we know the voice of our Lord, and it's time to get out of here. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They will rise prior, ahead, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Just think about what's being communicated there. <laughs> Paul's saying that's what's going to happen to you, church. The, the word to be caught up is harpazo in the Greek. It means to be snatched away violently from something unto something else. Well, where, what about rapture? You're always talking about the rapture, Pastor. It's in the, yeah, it's in the Latin Vulgate Bible. If you've got, anybody got a Latin Vulgate Bible? No, it's rapturus. That's, it's rapturus or rapture sounds better than harpazo. Doesn't harpazo sounds like it, something going flat? You're, my tire went harpazo. <laughs> Rapture. Rapturous. There's joy, right? No, in the Greek, beautiful. We're, we're snatched away. Jesus, the groom, comes for his bride. The whole wedding system, the Jewish wedding system, we don't have time to go over that. The beautiful picture of the groom coming for the bride, unannounced at any moment. That's why she always has to be prepared so he can come and snatch her and take her away to the Father's house. It's such a beautiful picture that we have presented. And so we who are alive, we're going to be caught up together with them, with the, with the saints that have gone before us in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So beautiful, the rapture of the church. Listen, when we take communion... The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I think it's like verse 26, he said, when we take communion, we, we believers proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Did you know that? When you take the bread in your hand, something tangible to remind us of his sacrifice, when we take the cup, something tangible 
representing his blood that was shed, the new covenant for us. When we take that, we're saying, yes, Lord, I believe you died for me and you're coming back for me. And I'm looking forward to that, to that day, that upward call, to the trumpet sound, to your voice, your majestic voice that will happen in a moment, just like that, in the twinkling of an eye. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Yes. Something else happens, though. This flesh and blood can't inherit heaven. If you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read. You guys ready? No? You guys, you good? 1 Corinthians 15. Remember I mentioned the thing about the new bods? You remember that? No, let me remind you. Old bod from the sod, new bod from God. You guys got it. If you get a chance to read this chapter, it would be amazing. Such a great reminder. I'm going to just pick up in verse 50 because of time purposes. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So the need for resurrection, the need for new bodies. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What does sleep mean again? To die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the rapture happens, just like that. We're all caught up together, and while we're uh, midair, in the process somewhere, we're changed. Our bodies are changed. We get our new bods. No amens? I'm saying amen. Thank you, Lord. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly wait means to look for continually, expectantly. Jesus is coming. I'm looking for him. What's he going to do when he shows up? Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Did you guys catch that? The Lord's going to show up and he's going to transform. There's going to be a metamorphosis. There's going to be a change in our bodies and our bodies will look like whose body? Like his. Does it say that anywhere else? It sure does. 1 John 3. I'm going to read it. 1 John 3. You guys ready?
1 John 3. Beloved, dearly loved ones, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know what that means? Exactly what it says. We don't know what we're, when he's revealed, we don't know what we're going to look like, except that we're going to look like him. Well, what did he look like when he rose again from the dead? He could pass through walls, pop in, pop out. You guys remember that? He could still eat. So we're like, yeah, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> Not gain a pound. I joke about that, but have you thought about having a new body? Just think about, for a minute, no pain. Having no pain in your life. I'm not just talking about physical pain. Some of us carry around emotional and mental, maybe spiritual How about no more sickness? Man. No more sickness, no more runny noses, coughs, sore throats. No more disease. No more cancer. Think about all the things that plague these bodies. I think no more cerebral palsy. I think about my boy all the time. To be able to run with him, to hear his little voice again, like, and it's all because of Jesus. New bodies fitted for all eternity because he gave his body for us. Because he endured the cross. He took on flesh and blood. suffered in our place, tasted death so that we might not have to, tasted separation from God that you and I might not have to. That we'd always be connected with our Jesus. His heart in all of this, he tells us in the next chapter, is that whether we wake or whether we sleep, that we would live with him. Whether we're alive or dead, that we would be connected with him in a special, beautiful way. And Paul says, I want you guys to comfort one another with those words. Your loved one, a Christian, they're with Jesus. And Jesus is coming. Listen, listen death is not permanent. Separation is not the end of the story. They're going to be coming with Jesus. We know where they are. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Death is a door we walk through because Jesus died and rose again. Jesus is coming for us to bring us to the Father's house so we can all live together with him. New bodies, blown away by different facets of his grace for all eternity. And the author, Paul said, I'm gonna finish with this because we're out of time. In Colossians 3, the apostle Paul writes there, Here's the application. What was the application for today, man? I'm, I'm hearing some good stuff. I'm comforted. I'm ready to comfort. And listen, to, listen to what the book says. If then 
you were raised with Christ. As Jesus raised us, as Jesus raised us, y'all, we were dead in our trespasses. He has made us alive. Right? Correct? Amen. That happened when we put our trust in Jesus. Miracle. Born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Got to be born again. I've been raised. Hallelujah. That's when we do baptism. That's what we celebrate, right? Old man dead under the water. Some of you, some of you I hold down a little longer than others. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't, don't let that frighten you away from being obedient to Jesus. When you get dunked under the water, that's what, man, the old man's dead. The old Mike, he's dead and buried. I come up now in the newness of life. I'm following Jesus. I'm, I'm going down his trail, following him, living for him, living with him. If we've been raised with Christ, what does Paul say? Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Seek, those, seek heavenly things. Let me ask you a question. Are you seeking heavenly things this morning? Don't answer me. Just let it wash over you. Are you seeking heavenly things? Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. You know what that tells us? We have the ability to seek and we have the ability to set. Set your mind on things above. When you start to set your mind on things above, what happens? Man, you start to live for the Lord, for things that matter. You invest in things that are eternal. What's eternal? The Lord is his word. People are. I'm investing my life in a way that will matter for all time and eternity. Set your mind on things above. For, if, for you died, old Mikey dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ, who is our life, appears. When Jesus shows up, you also will appear with him in glory. Oh, that's good news, isn't it? Did you earn it? Were you so good and getting gooder and gooder? Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you so much for your amazing grace, the amazing work that you did for us and the amazing work you're continuing to do in us and amongst us and through us, Lord. We're so grateful to be your children. Behold what manner of love that we might be called the children of God. Thank you that you are coming, Lord. Thank you for our loved ones that are with you and that you're going to bring them with you. And we will be reunited in the air heading off to the Father's house to live with you always. Thank you for all your promises. They are all yes and amen. We're so just so blessed. Thank you for the comfort of your word this morning. And as we are still in an attitude of prayer this morning, as we finish our Bible study, perhaps you've been listening this morning and you realize that you've never really come to know Jesus. You've never entered into a personal relationship with him. Maybe you know about him or what others have said about him, but he wants to have a relationship with you. All things are created by him and for him. He loves you. He demonstrated his love for you by coming and dying on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He suffered and died and was buried and rose again on the third day, demonstrating that everything he said is true, that he is able to save to the uttermost all that come to him. You come to him this morning. You come just as you are. Listen, I'm not asking you to join a church or sign some membership card, perform some ritual. None of those things will save you, will provide forgiveness. 
bring you hope and eternal life. It's only Jesus. You come just as you are to him. Is that you this morning? Can I pray with you? You're saying, yeah, Mike, I want to give my heart to Jesus right now. I want to pray with you. And we'll pray. I'll pray a simple prayer. You can follow along with me. I'm just going to ask you, just raise up your hand. Let's pray together right now if that's you. And we'll pray together. Anyone at all this morning, the most important decision you'll ever make is concerning your eternity. And if that's you, praise the Lord. Awesome. You can put your hand down. Anyone else this morning? Anyone else? I don't want to stop if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart this morning. Anyone else? God bless you. I see your hand. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Anyone else this morning? So sweet. For these two that have raised their hands, you can repeat this prayer. Real simple, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying for me, for my sins. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you wash me and cleanse me and make me new? You promised you would. Would you fill me with your spirit? I don't want to go back to those sins anymore. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I love you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for these two precious ones that have committed their lives to you. Would you keep them close to your heart, cause them to thrive and to grow and to flourish under your care, the good shepherd's care. Stir up the giftings and callings that you've given them. Bless them, Lord. Use them radically for your glory. We thank you so much. We know there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. We rejoice with those who rejoice this morning. We're so grateful that our names are written in heaven and that we belong to you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name, your precious and holy name, that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right. There is a photo booth to take a picture uh, this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go and let's stand together for one last song. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter what.
keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. goodness, Lord, towards us. Lord, thank you that we uh, belong to you. Lord, those that have placed their trust in you, Jesus, have passed from death to life. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the great work that you've done in our hearts, our lives, and that you continue to do, Lord. And we are excited, Lord, for that day where you will call us home to be with you. Wherever you are, Lord, we will be with you. And I pray that be a comfort this morning, Lord, that we would set our minds on um, things above, Lord, our perspective would be changed. We have an eternal perspective afresh this morning. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Work in us and through us for your glory. Lord, may we abide in you, bear fruit for your glory. And I pray now that you would bless our time of fellowship, Lord. May be sweet um, in your sight, Lord, as you knit us closer together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.